Hi, my name is Alexis Baines, and I'm from UIC. Hi, I'm Robin Elgato. I'm from Northeastern Illinois University. Hello, my name is Adma. I'm a rising junior now at the University of Illinois Chicago, studying chemistry. Hi, I'm Jeff from Richmond. I'm from City College of Chicago. And our research question is, will providing educational outreach programming to female sex workers help reduce the rates of cervical cancer in high-risk neighborhoods of Chicago? So as an overview, we're gonna be going over what is cervical cancer, the risk factors for cervical cancer, how it can be prevented, um, some groups that are at increased risk of developing cervical cancer, some community areas and resources, and our intervention. So what is cervical cancer? Cervical cancer is a type of cancer that develops in a woman's cervix. The cervix is the entrance to the womb from the vagina. Various strains of the HPV virus play a role in the development of cervical cancer, specifically those being strains 16 and 18. Uh, usually when a woman is exposed to the HPV virus, uh, their immune system often stops the virus before it can do any damage. But however, in some cases, the virus can stay for up to years and cause cells on the surface of the cervix to become cancerous. So this is a, uh, this is a couple pictures of the, uh, this is a picture of, the woman's, of a woman's cervix. Um, right here is cervical cancer, and then this is a picture of, the, of a woman's reproductive system, and right here is cervical cancer as well. Uh, so there are two types of cells that line the surface of the, surface of the cervix. The first being glandular cells, which are columnar shaped, and the second being squamous cells, that are thin and flat. Between these two cells is usually where cancer develops. And then there are two types of cervical cancer. First one being squamous cell carcinoma, which begins in squamous cells that line the outer part of the cervix. Uh, most cervical cancers are squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, the second being adenocarcinoma, which begins in glandular cells that line the cervical canal. And then uh, the symptoms of cervical cancer, in the early stages are often no symptoms, and in more advanced stages, uh, a woman can experience vaginal bleeding after intercourse, between periods, or after menopause. They can also experience watery and bloody, bloody vaginal discharge that can be heavy or have a foul odor, and then also pelvic pain or pain during intercourse. Uh, so the risk factors for cervical cancer, the first one being, the first highest risk factor being H the HPV virus. Some additional risk factors are uh, increasing in early sexual activity, having multiple sexual partners, uh, early pregnancy, other STIs and STDs, having a weakened immune system, which often occurs in when someone has uh, HIV, smoking, and uh, alcohol use, as well as drug use. So what is HPV? HPV stands for the human papillomavirus infection, and um, it requires it requires skin to skin contact and more than it's an infection that requires skin to skin contact, and more than half of sexually sexually active women can actually acquire HPV, making the most prevalent sexually act, sexually transmitted infection. And there's about 150 to 200 different types of strains of HPV, and of those and of those two, uh, 100. 150 to 200 strains, 15 of those are actually known to have caused a cervical cancer because it's able to transform infected cells into malignant tumor cells. Is, um, the infection can also lead to um, genital warts depending on the strain or it could go away on its own. And for males, it could cause penile cancers. And it can be contracted vaginally, orally, and anally. And if people don't get treatment earlier on, these can develop into a type of cancer on those points of contact. And even when, even when a person has no symptoms whatsoever, they're still putting themselves at risk, and the person that they're, that they're having um, sexual contact with at risk to getting HPV. So one of the best ways to prevent um, HPV is to get the HPV vaccination at an earlier age. And the most effective ways to prevent um, the risk of getting HPV and cervical cancer is to get routine pap smears every three years. That way they'll be able to detect any abnormalities in the cervix so that um, they won't be able to contract a cervical cancer. And they should also practice safe sex, which is condom use, 
um, delaying sexual activity, so waiting until you're older, and um, also reducing the number of sexual partners that you have. So our target group that has a great risk of developing cervical cancer in Chicago are actually female sex workers. So female sex workers are women who, who voluntarily join the sex working industry. Um, totally voluntary, it's not forced or anything, it's not sex trafficking, this is totally voluntary. And they perform sexual acts in compensation for food, money, shelter, clothing, etc. And this is a list of the common types of um, cancers among sex workers. And as you can see, cervical cancer is more prevalent among this population, followed by oral, lung, and anal cancer. And people that are infected with HIV are, um, they actually have a compromised immune system, make, making them more susceptible to also being co-infected with HPV. And in combination with HP, HPV and HIV, they're overall, like, they're overall, like, more able to contract or develop um, cervical cancer. So why are cervical, so why are sex workers more likely to get cervical cancer? Well, studies have shown that since they have very low education on, um, on sex ed than the, than the general population, they're more likely to have sex at a younger age also um, compared to the general population. They have sex with multiple people due to their line of work, and they compromise their immune system or they weaken their immune system due to drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes, and all, the, all those factors, and all those factors um, together gets them at a higher risk to get HPV and other STIs. And since since um, sexual education plays a key role in this, they won't be able to know when to get back, when to get vaccinated, when to get screened, so they won't be able to detect any abnormalities, which puts them at a greater risk over time to develop sexual um, cervical cancer. Well, with this chart, this is actually a chart of um, the average sex worker. The average sex worker normally starts at the age of 10. The average female, like you like, to like average teenage female, actually starts at the age of 13, 14. But the average sex worker actually started at the age of 10 in the United States. The majority of the sex workers in the United States now are actually 17. <coughs> Okay, so now we're just gonna uh, give you guys uh, an overview of what our mission is for this study. So we're not uh, here to promote or advertise uh, prostitution in any way. We're just mainly focusing on the prevention of cervical cancer through HPV um, control uh, in transition. So then the map that you see here, this is just um, the prostitution hotspots in the city of Chicago. And as you can see, it's mostly highlighted towards the south side, a little bit on the southwest, um, and then you'll have like Washington Park and um, New City, West Inglewood, and Inglewood. So now these two maps are maps that we found from the Chicago Health Atlas. The map on the left shows the incidence of cervical cancer. So people that are diagnosed that actually um, that know that they um, they have cervical cancer. But on the right hand are the deaths of cervical cancer, and as you can see, the map there has like higher rates and it's shaded a lot darker because as people are dying from cervical cancer, and obviously they're not being diagnosed for it. And then this is just a map of the cities that we'll be targeting: uh, Washington Park, Greater Grand Crossing, and Gresham. That will be our group one. And then the green arrows: New City, West Inglewood, and Inglewood are the cities that will be our group two, which is going to be our control group. So then how will we fix this issue and this gap between uh, the deaths of cervical cancer and the people that are actually diagnosed? So our methodology, we will have uh, 250 participants for group one, and that will, like I said, will include Washington Park, Greater Grand Crossing, and um, Greater Grand Area, and Russia. So this uh, group will actually be having a one hour educational course. And our group two, which is our control group, as well as there are, they are also going to have 250 participants every year. Um, and then this group, instead of having the one-hour educational course, that we will provide them with uh, educational brochures. Okay, so just a, a pretty much like an overview of what you will be seeing in the next couple of slides is how will we recruit them. So we will do that with our community partners, um, and then. 
We will also do that through the flyers and baseline survey. We will also provide them with an identification number. Uh, and the educational course, which will be focused for group one, uh, screens and vaccines, which will be offered to both of the groups. And then the post survey, just to give us a good, um, pretty much an overview of our data analysis. So we're gonna advertise for our focus group, um, so we can actually advertise, especially to the female workers. Uh, we're not saying that it's not for all females, but we're just more so worried about this population particularly. Um, we would find, we would um, do it through brochures, it would be that will be more effective and then through the focus group, like for to actually come in participating, we will give them uh, $20 gift cards. Okay, so now for our baseline survey, this is actually how we'll be recruiting our participants. We will have them just fill out a couple of questions that include like sexual activity, community of residence, previous vaccinations, or medical history, your birth, preferred method of contact, uh, last pap smear, um, if you were ever vaccinated for HPV, and if you ever received any education for HPV or cervical cancer. So after they fill out this baseline survey, they will receive an identification number and a $10 gift card uh, just for filling out these couple of questions. But then group one will also have the educational course after the survey, and then group two will have just, we'll just hand them the brochure. The educational course will be held once a month for group one. Like she said, group two will only get a handout. And um, but we're primarily working on trying to prevent, getting, we'll actually give the HPV vaccine and actually prevent cervical cancer within the sex worker community. Um, it'll be held twice a month and our community partners and pap smears and testing, STI testing, SD testing will be held once a month. The HPV vaccine also through Merck, they actually have a couple of programs, but this program actually will be more so for the providers to be able to get the vaccine at a cheaper price because we noticed that most of the community like clinics, they actually don't carry the vaccine because it's actually said to be too expensive. And then once they do uh, complete uh, the course or once they have been given out that survey, our, actually our educational course is just to persuade them into going out and getting these screenings and um, if they haven't already had the HPV vaccine, for them to actually go out and find it, which we will also provide for them. Um, so, but we understand that not all of our participants who have attended our one hour course or who have been given the brochure will participate in the screenings, the screenings and the HPV vaccines. Um, so we will be sending out a post survey, which will just include like general um, feedback experience, knowledge of cervical cancer um, and HPV, like how did you hear about us? Um, what did you actually go out and get screened, if, even if it wasn't from our uh, community? And then um, did you actually receive the HPV vaccine? And after um, this survey is submitted back to us, you will be handed a $20 gift card. So um, yeah, we understand that our our methodology is a little um, hard to understand because we do have two different groups that will be encountering two different things throughout the study. So we will just focus on our recruitment with the SWAP community partners and then we will have them fill out the baseline survey, which they will have, um, group one will have the one hour course or the flyer. Then after that, they will have the identification number given with a $10 gift card. Both groups will be offered the screening and vaccinations. Um, after that, they, we will reach out to them and have them fill out the post survey and we will compensate them so that way we can have as many of these surveys submitted back to us. Um, they will be receiving a $20 gift card after that. And then we will use these post surveys uh, as a comparison um, for both of the groups and to see if that educational course actually persuaded them into going out and taking action for their own health. So for our data analysis, our short term, is um, that after every year consider um, the correlation and to collect the data and then we want to actually do this whole thing for 15 years to actually see if the, the mortality rate in those particular communities actually goes down but we realize like the incident rate may actually go up because now more people are getting screened and vaccinated in case of uh, abnormal results we can actually refer them to the nearest hospital or to one of our community partners 
Um, personally, uh, I actually do like SWAP. SWAP is, SWAP is actually Sex Workers uh, Outreach Project. They distribute uh, condoms all through Chicago. They actually do mental, they help with mental um, illness, as well as helping with legal advice. It's, they do a lot of job training, as well as we can also recruit for our focus group through SWAP. They actually are really throughout Chicago. Um, another resource that I do prefer is that we did actually look and actually kind of like was Christian Community Health. It's not faith-based, but if you would prefer to go in that direction, you are able to. They have an ob guy. They actually have a mobile van that goes throughout Chicago. They offer dental since that is quite important to me. But since most of the sex workers actually do get oral cancer, and they also offer health care. And in part, it's prostitution alternative round table. They offer housing and they offer job training for sex workers. And they also also started a program called Wings that um, if you have a sex record, a sex worker record from 2013 is automatically expunged. So how will this impact our patients and communities? Well, if anything, we hope that this project brings attention to, underserved, to this underserved population because they're not putting only their, themselves at risk, but they're also putting um, the communities in which they live in at risk. And with this, we're also to spread awareness about HPV and how, to, um, how these sex workers can help pre prevent themselves from getting it, giving them a sense of um, uh, self-empowerment, body empowerment, and how to live a healthy, more healthy lifestyle and like um, also giving them access to resources and people that are reaching out to them so they don't have to be alone. If they do test positive for um, these certain things, we could actually like um, refer to them to people that are actually in the same position as them so they won't feel alone in, the, in that time of their life. We'll, we will also be hoping to increase the frequency of pap smears and screenings to promote the quality of life in these high risk cervical cancer areas. And we're also doing this to help encourage the improvement of equity in healthcare to show that every life matters no matter the profession. And the benefits to science, we are hoping that um, this project will also help optimize the quality of screenings to detect HPV and cervical cancer at a more accurate rate, well, at a more accurate rate. And to, to signify awareness in disease prevention versus treatment because it's less expensive. It, um, it will also help enhance networking and trust between the healthcare system and sex workers, as well as the outreach programs. And it will provide more modern research towards this, um, towards a certain population because research is very limited because it is an illegal profession. And we are also hoping to update statistics on the population of sex workers, cervical cancer screenings, cervical cancer incidence rates, and cervical cancer mortality rates. And so what are the limitations of the study? Well, one of the, one of the, most, um, one of the most limiting factors is the map for, the prostitu for prostitution, because um, due, to that, due to that limitation, it was only focused on that one area. We weren't able to get a broader range of areas, so we could choose um, two communities or two groups that were farther apart from each other to, do, to avoid any disruptions in data or people moving to the other community to receive those special education um, classes. Um, being a sex worker is an illegal profession, so it's actually hard for us to actually determine if a person is a sex worker without them, without alarming them to fear of like being jailed after they have told us that they are working as a sex worker. Another thing is lack of data. Um, so we're still at a starting point in this project, so um, there, and due to lack of data, um, it'll take time to determine whether or not our project will actually have an impact on this, um, on this community and on um, cervical cancer death rates. And we're also unsure how much of the sex worker population is actually part of the main population of cervical cancer mortality rates in general. And due to that previous point, it'll also take more time to see if there is this a um, significant correlation between our sexual education and vaccinations, um, and whether or not it will cause like, an increase or decrease in cervical cancer mortality rates. And we also have to take into account of uh, new um, residents coming into those areas and our, um, and our um, test subjects going out of the area, so there's constantly gonna be people coming in and people coming out, so there's no way for us to actually track that unless we have like a controlled environment. 
Um, these are our acknowledgments. We'd like to thank Dr. Melissa Simon for always being there to support us. We, we really appreciate her. For Northwestern and UIC, uh, for Northwestern University and UIC, um, our coordinators, um, Shania and Melinda, all the Chicago Czech um, program presenters, our senior fellows who have been so much help to us in giving us incredible feedback, and all our fellowship peers. I'm really going to miss you guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you.